Hi all, uh, Jan Louis van der Berg. Just to summarize the workflow before arriving at our tensioner technique. Workflow would then be a restricted, a restricted personal tibia cut first, followed by femoral planning, which is then hybridizing measured resection, then gap balancing, limb alignment and shape matching. To be a planning first of the utmost importance. So arriving at our proposed restricted kinematic alignment values. I would be accepting a MPTA of four degrees varus to two degrees of valgus. Reason being, if we look at the normal variances, uh, I know there are many studies, but looking at Bellemans specifically, of his 500 knees that he depicted uh, MPTA varying between a zero and approximately 6.5 degrees of varus. Secondly, we look at the kinematic alignment data which has been published by Howell, 98% tenure survival, and he was happy to have an MPTA from 8 degrees varus to 6 degrees valgus. It's uh, depicted here. Yeah. <coughs> Thirdly, Pagnano is willing to settle for 3 degrees varus to 3 degrees valgus with his new uh, uh, talk, Can We Safely Explore a New Paradigm? Therefore, uh, proposed restricted kinematic acceptable values would be between 4 to 2 MPTA. As far as the general alignment is concerned, we would be happy to accept 3 degrees varus to valgus, although we could probably uh, accept a little bit more. Looking at the normal values, again, of about a thousand normal uh, people depicted by Singh, Shetty, Bellamans and Ekhoff. We have approximately 60% of the population between three Varus and three Valgus with uh, approximately 30% Varus outliers and only 10% Valgus outliers. Posterior slope is another consideration and uh, personally I'd be happy to accept between zero and eight degrees. Normal variance is 7 uh, plus minus 3.8 or uh, as values from Weinberg and Ma. Of interest is the concerns for tibial component failure. Mennedipal looked at the kinematic alignment group and he found that uh, it wasn't the various valgus outliers that caused the failure but the posterior slope outliers where the slope was five degrees greater than the controls. Interesting there is look at the mean value of 11.2 degrees. And that was more than 2,000 uh, kinematic aligned knees. So our proposed restricted kinematic alignment acceptable values. The tibia is cut and we can now move on to the stress range of motion collection. This is a very important topic for me. Uh, so looking at tensioning the goal, I would uh, put as arriving at a balanced soft tissue envelope after a total knee arthroplasty with an acceptable range of anatomic variances with minimal soft tissue release performed. Considerations would be personal laxity and Roth uh, have a good paper on the personal laxities of patients and here we can see uh, on the lateral side between three to four millimeters and on the medial side two millimeters between the native ACL and the kinematic aligned knees. 
Secondly, we look at the bony pathology, the morphology or osteophytes, and then thirdly, the soft tissue contractures and acquired laxities. These will all have an influence on our tensioning. Cruciate ligament influence is an important factor, and the first question everybody must ask himself is, uh, is the effect of posterior cruciate ligament resection predictable? And the answer is, Schnur and Koenig did a study and found that uh, the flexion gap is increased in many cases after posterior cruciate resection, many times not, but sometimes as much as nine millimeters. And personally, I think they uh, underestimated sometimes even more. Second uh, consideration would be the cruciate ligament influence as the flexion gap can increase uh, if the ligament is resected. Therefore, if uh, that is true, then the tibia inflection is suspend suspended or hangs on the posterior cruciate. Therefore, if you use a bi-tensioner with uh, variable tensioning forces in flexion, it could toggle inflection through to extension and would not give a totally accurate reading. However, Increased distraction tension force also enlarges the flexion gap as the PC is more vertically forced. This is according to the article by Jan Victor in 2017. Uh, there we see it and also translation of the tibia anterior relative to the femur as force is increased. Timing of the tensioning procedure is also of utmost importance and it is maximized, accuracy can be maximized by controlling as many factors as possible that could influence the outcome. Therefore, before tensioning, osteophytes are removed around the femur and tibia as well as the menisci, the loose capsule and superiosteri is uh, loosened and then we are ready to perform the personal restricted tibia cut, which we have performed already. Question of bi-tensioning or monotensioning. Bi-tensioning, as discussed, could toggle inflection if the posterior cruciate is still intact. Monotensioning has always to be a relative to the contralateral side. So evaluation of the contralateral side is important. If it is deranged or patholo pathological, it will give an inaccurate uh, reading. But if it represents the restricted personal tibia joint line, it will result in the most accurate tension reading. Acceptable tension force, uh, this article by Jester Bierk and uh, Ritchie, uh, they used a tension force of 80 newtons in their uh, paper, although they suggested one a little bit less. Hand-stressed range of motion. Our problem is it does not reliably reflect the ligament tension because valgus varus stress applied in extension and flexion is influenced by hip rotation and therefore it's not constant. It's confounded by the osteophytes and soft tissue structures. The solution would be a differential tensioning. You do your restricted native constitutional tibia joint line cut, you have a stable platform, followed by a constant and a reproducible stress throughout the range of motion by a ligament tensioner. So this is the tensioner that we use. It's actually very, it's nose friendly or nose proof and it can easily be sterilized. It can be calibrated and it consists of a short torque wrench which can be calibrated from the inside to deliver through the mechanism to either the left blade or the right blade a constant force of 80 newtons. Therefore, if this is or represents the restricted 
kinematic joint line on the one side, then we want a constant force on the other side, which we can then toggle till the torque wrench clicks. Once it clicks, we've calibrated a constant force on the flexi blade of 80 newtons, which could then produce a constant tension force from flexion through to extension while we rail riding the constant joint line on the other side. We then reconfigure this tensioner, put a spacer on the right side and put a flexi blade on the left side. Reproduce or reinsert the tensioner into the flexion space, toggle it until we, it clicks. We know with the torque wrench we've got a constant force on the flexi blade on this side of 80 newtons. Again, we can take it through the range of motion while a rail riding on the opposite side. Therefore, a true differential ligament tensioner. So here we have the operation procedure, our tensioner placed in the flexion space and we can see in this instance a XR knee with the rigid platform on the left side and the tension or flexi blade on the right side. You can also see the uh, torque wrench just sticking out on the right side. There we actually toggle the torque wrench and create our constant 80 Newton of tension in the flexi blade on the right side. We now take the knee through its range of motion. Then we reconfigure the tension blade by changing the rigid blade to the right side and a flexi blade to the left side. Our tension is uh, assessed and uh, depicted on the screen and hence we can start with our femoral placement planning by hybridizing the measured resection, gap balancing, limb alignment and shape matching. Thank you.